Good evening, good evening, one and all. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Meadowbrook Maryville Cure Bible Study Series entitled Principles from the Parables. Our indicative text taken from Matthew 13, 13, Jesus says, therefore I speak to them in parables. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and we ask you to sit back and relax. We believe that God has a treat for us this evening, this afternoon. But you know, before we start, we always feel that we should invite God to tabernacle with us and to, and to lead us. So at this time, I want to ask our sister Jean Lee, if she would just do the opening prayer for us. Sister Jean. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of studying your Holy Word. And as Archdeacon Leroy comes to lead us in this study, we pray that your Holy Spirit would attend him, would give us listening ears, would give us eager hearts to embrace your word, we pray, Father, that you would so work in speaker and listeners, participants all alike, that your word would bring forth fruit in every life. We pray for the entire team behind the Bible study. We pray your blessing, we pray your clearance, of all interference, so that your voice would be heard tonight and also would, would be heard wherever persons tune in to the recording. Please, Lord, bring about transformation in our lives. Help us not to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Jean, for that lovely invocation. Brothers and sisters, we have been going on a journey over the last three months, looking at our overarching theme, principles from the parables. Those of you who are jo joining us for the first time, want to remind you that you can watch the Bible studies because they're posted on our YouTube channel. And we also want to tell you that you can, there's still time to invite a friend to join us. Our platform can hold 500 persons. Want to remind you that tonight is going to be a very interactive session. Our Bible teacher will be asking a number of questions, going to ask you to remember to have your Bibles out so that you will be able to, when asked, to read and be prepared to participate and to answer the questions as we go from section to section in this Bible study. We started in September with the overarching theme, Principles from the Parables. Our sub-theme for the first month was Essential Truths for Living. And we looked at the parables of the wise and foolish builders, the rich man and his bonds, and the shrewd manager. In October, our sub-theme was Principles from Agriculture. And we looked at the unfruitful fig tree, the growing seed, the mustard seed, and the yeast, the fishing net, and the workers in the vineyard. And in this month of November, we now have a new sub-theme, Life Lessons. And last week, we looked at the parable of the great banquet. This evening, we'll be looking at two parables in one, the builder and the king. Sit back, enjoy, be prepared to participate and to answer questions when asked. But before we hand over to our presenter, our Bible teacher this evening, our reflection piece is total praise. With your mics muted, you can sing along and worship. And when 
We're back. I will introduce our presenter. Total praise. praise. You are my strength. What a way for us to start our Bible study for this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce our Bible teacher this evening. He hails from Portland. He pursued ministerial studies at the United Theological College and the University of the West Indies, Mona. And he did his curacy at St. Luke's Church, Crossroads, he was a priest in charge at Holy Trinity Retreat, St. Mary. He was the rector of the Church of the Reconciliation in Portmore, St. George's, Savannah Lamar in Westmoreland. And his mantra is, God has given to every individual community all that they need to fulfill what he requires of them at any given moment. Many of you may know him as Lamy, but it is my pleasure this evening to introduce our presenter, the Venerable Leroy Johnson, Archdeacon of Mandeville and the Rector of the St. Gabriel's Cure of Souls, Maypen Clarendon. Archdeacon, over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> Our relationship is coming from very far from the days of Portmore. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure.
to be with you all at this Bible study hosted by the Meadowbrook Maryvale Cure. When I had, I think, 61, that, that was a high for us um, at one of our Bible study sessions. I thought, wow, this is record. But, you know, I had the privilege of peeping in on one or two of yours. And trust me, I'm impressed. Congratulations. I must say, congratulations. I think Bible study is good. It's one of the sure ways in which we grow in our faith, in our relationship with Christ. And it will enable us to be better ambassadors for him, no doubt. Well, we are looking at principles from the parables, and I've been given a parable for us to examine today from St. Luke 14. I was given verses 27 to 33, but I will urge us to begin at verse 25 and end at 35. Do we normally ask somebody to read it all at the beginning? Or we yes, Rev. If it is your wish, yes. I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. Could somebody appoint themselves? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation, and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So I'm sure you would have read it before for yourself, but it's good to hear it afresh. May I, let me just make a statement before we delve into the parable. And it is that parables, and you need to note this whenever you're approaching a parable, parables are part of the autobiography of God. Remember that. Parables are part of the autobiography of God. So they speak firstly about God and then about us or uh, the world or other things. And so whenever you read a parable, you should ask, what does this say about God? And then, what does it say about us and others? That is important. So Luke 14, 25 to 35, is a compilation of several of Jesus's Sorry, maybe I should tell you my approach first of all. I'm going to lay a foundation. 
And then I have some points or principles that I'll pull out of the passage. And after explaining each principle, I'll be asking questions, all right? So I would ask that if you have questions now, you will note them and later on, you can ask, but I'll be asking some questions and those will be highlighted on the screen. Okay. All right, let me continue. Luke 14, 25 to 35 is a compilation of several of Jesus's parables that describe the nature, condition, and resources for abundant living. The parable has to be interpreted from the bottom up. And so you're looking at the back end, you know, and then come forward. Do you ever want to skip over the end of a novel to see how it comes out? before reading the unfolding mystery? Have you ever thought reading a, a book and then you just want to see how it's gonna end and then you go back to the front? Well, I have. That's the approach we should perhaps take to this series of parables in this passage. They all lead up to the climax in verses 34 and 30. Five. Could somebody read those verses for me? Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pie. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. The word Thank of you. the Lord. Thank you. Jesus came to enable Christians with a tongue. And I, I want to use as my little sub theme, uh, 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 my little theme, identifying Christians with a tongue. Identifying Christians with a tongue. Who are these people? These are people who are distinctive, sharp, pungent, salty Christians with an incisive quality that seasons the life of others and society. These are Christians with a tongue. Saline Christians bring zest and gusto to life. Like salt, they bring out the best of the flavor of living. That's the kind of an enabling process we'll find in this parable that precedes the desired end, producing tangy Christians. That's why I said we have to start from the back end. I start with that in mind. So a great multitude followed the master. And there's something about Jesus that was always attractive and attracting. Throughout his earthly ministry, crowds always followed him. Whether they hated him, they wanted to kill him, or they just loved him, or they were just curious, but always there was a crowd around him. He wanted them though to realize what they were really doing by joining his company. They were encountering a demand in God, and then he needed to know that. He had committed all in the incarnation, and he demanded nothing less from those who responded. Jesus in these parables states the cost of discipleship with alarming clarity. The disciples must put him and the living God he incarnated first in their lives before family and friends, plans and ambition. So they must count the cost. 
The parable of the uncompleted tower verifies this truth. Then, as if that were not enough, he follows quickly with another parable. The king's rash warfare. All this is to dramatize a traumatic truth. Don't begin discipleship without understanding the high cost of faithfulness. You understand that? I always like to see what happens after confirmation. There's always an excitement for the next few weeks. And everybody's in church every Sunday. But as one politician says, when the raw rise over, you know, what next? And you find that things just peter out and then you have to search for them, you know, between the pews. But, you know, the Lord demands total commitment, total faithfulness. In the end, if the cost of discipleship results in sheer joy, then you'll find that it's all worth it because it's joy for you and a joy for others whose lives you will impact. A breakthrough to this discipleship will radiate in a vitality, freedom, and a joy that cannot be found in no other way. As this chorus says, if you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. And those who have accepted Jesus' invitation, they are basking in that today. You know, when Paul finally, you know, uh, got the aha moment of his life, there was no greater joy. He says what? Everything else I had, I count but dumb. They cannot be compared with the joy that I find in Christ Jesus at all. We will have the pungent penetrating aroma of Christ. Life will be exciting. Christ's demand will have delivered us from the mediocrity of secondary loyalties. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, and by extension us, you are the salt of the earth. He did say you are the light as well, but today we are focusing on salt. If the salt loses its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? Matthew 5, 13. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying here, we cannot afford to lose our time. We cannot afford to lose our time. I'm going to now provide us with seven considerations as to what it means to be Christians with a tongue. Remember, we're saying we are bearing in mind the back end of the parable. And these points will emerge, of course, from the passage in question. So after each short presentation, I will open the floor for, I ask a question. And if you have any, you can ask related. So first point to pull from the passage. Tang in the Christian life comes from the indwelling Christ himself. He is the God salt in life. If anyone comes to me, verse 26, you know, so if you come to him, that will happen. Salt works by association. It must be placed in the food to bring out its taste. Christ challenged us in, and his disciple, and by extension us, 
in St. John 15, to abide in him and to allow him to abide in them and us. A personal relationship with Christ is key to what we consider being and doing. Being and doing. So to who you become and what you are able to do. A personal relationship with Christ is important. He did say in John 50, apart from me, you can do nothing at all. Just as food is flavored by salt, one's natural capacities are maximized when we form a personal relationship with Christ. The problem I find with some of who claim to be Christ ambassadors today, some of the DJs who maybe just want to put on a show. So although they, 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 at that moment they will claim knowledge of Christ and they will sing some correct things, theology good and so on. But when you examine their lifestyle, very often so much is left to be desired of their relationship with Christ. And so it comes across empty after a while. And maybe that's why, you know, Lady Saw is getting all the bashing. You remember Ninja Man, Brother Desmond, <laughs> when he was Brother Desmond, and he was around crusade and all of that. And the next moment he was what? Gun Panty, Dan Gaga. So you see, <laughs> we can give these mixed signals. Jesus will call us the Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. And so that level of consistency is important. But it is only as we abide in Christ that this level of consistency in us will be demonstrated. So the question I want for you, the first question, answer, and each person should try to answer it, whether within your own heart or if you want to share, answer with us. Is this, yes, would you consider yourself an inside insider or an inside outsider? Before you answer, let me explain what that is. And I, I borrowed this, these terms from John Ogilvy, who wrote the book, Parables, the Autobiography of God. And it comes from one of the parables, I think it's a parable of the banquet, where there were persons there, but of course they never had their wedding garment on and so on. Now, an inside insider is a person inside of the church and they are inside of a personal relationship with Christ. An inside outsider is in the church, but they are outside of a personal relationship with Christ. Now, depending on who you are, it will make all the difference. And it's easy to know who are the inside insiders and who are the inside outsiders. The inside outside insider, because they have a commitment to Christ, they are also committed to the mission of Christ. They are commissioned to, committed to the work of the church. These are the people you can readily call on you understand, to assist in different ways. And they are not afraid to bring their gifts, their abilities to the table. As the song says, let us bring the gifts that differ. So these people who are always there in season and out of season and committed, they are dependable. These are inside insiders. An inside outsider can become the greatest stumbling block in the path of progress. We have them sometimes on the choir, they make no ends of trouble. We have them on the committee, no ends of trouble. We have them in the organization, no end 
because they do not want to see the church progress beyond where they have reached in their own growth path. So we have those. So the question is, would you consider yourself right now as an inside insider or an inside outsider? And why would you say you are the one or the other? Nobody wants to respond? Well, 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 if I would lead off, I, I would consider myself an inside insider. Yes, virtue. why? By virtue of the relationship that I am seeking to cultivate with God. Mm -hmm. um, it was not always so, um, but my journey has taken me to the point where uh, my relationship is of such that I'm not standing on the fence. I don't have my foot inside and my foot mm -hmm. outside. And it is my prayer that I will continue to do that. Okay. Would you say you have been an inside insider for a long time or it happened over time? I would say a long time, but it didn't okay. overnight. Okay. Didn't overnight. All right. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Because we have to, well, Christ would have already determined who we are, but you should have an idea too of who you are. Anybody else would like to respond? I see there this is some things in the chat you may want to read. Eh? Yes. Be Beverly Young, well, Jean says she's an inside insider. Beverly Young says, is it possible to be an inside insider who seeks to glorify himself or herself rather than Christ? That's a question that has been floated. No, no. If the focus is on you, then you're an inside outsider, I think. Yeah. And inside insider is someone who is really surrendered to Christ and is at the Lord's disposal, you know. Um, Rev, I, I would want to say um, it would take a very, very honest person to admit <laughs> they are inside, outside. I know, I know. What is important, though, is that we do some introspection, each of us, and be honest with ourselves and the Lord, because the Lord knows who we are. Well, what? So if we find that we are inside, outsider, you know, we should seek to work on our relationship with the Lord so that we become inside, insiders. Um, brave. I can, brave. May I ask, or can yeah. move on? Um, Brother Danny, may I just ask a question? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, this this is Brother James. Go yes. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, listen, listen to you about the, the characteristics of the two, the yes. two the identities. Yes. I'm just here wondering, is it possible? I'm just here wondering, uh, I'm on, on myself. Is it possible that one time you could be an insider? Inside, no. insider. And then mm -hmm. the next time mm -hmm. you are inside, outsider, is not possible, I mean, Reverend Johnson, for one to take on those two characteristics at different times yeah. and situations? Yeah, it can happen because people can change. But, you know, when you become really overwhelmed by Christ, it's really hard for you to go back but it's not impossible because we can become distracted by things of the world by self and all of that but um yes it, it's possible it's possible so but it would it, it would be expected that once you start to develop in christ though that um relationship would just blossom into beautiful things from there on not always the case because we have to keep feeding that relationship. Right. Because uh, Rev, I'm true, true Danny. Uh, because Rev, I was about to say, what yes. about the human element? Although we are Christians, 
and we are and we want to be and we want to stay permanently as the inside or outside. How can mm. the human element or the human forces you have just said interfere in that type of um, person's identity? It can, it can. And that's why even for Jesus in his human prayer, he spent so much time in prayer, you know, and we will, I think there's one point we'll make on that. He spent so much time with his father. And we are told we must put on the whole armor of Christ because the arm of flesh will fail us. And so we have to just constantly abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Thank you very so much. It, 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 there's a book, a little book that I read uh, by um, Brother Lawrence entitled, I think, Practicing in the Presence of the Lord practicing the presence of the Lord. And so he tried to be so conscious at all times of the Lord in whatever he was doing. If he was sweeping the floor, if he was cooking, if he was washing, whatever it was. And that's what we have to do at all times. Just keep the Lord before us, behind us. And there's a song which says, you know, uh, God be in my head, <laughs> by thinking, you know, God be in my feet, God be in my eyes, in my looking, whatever it is. So God should be before us, behind us, above us, below us at all times. It's that consciousness of him we have to live with. Can't trust our own self. Right. Well, it's important, though, that we seek to become inside, inside us, because these are the ones who will benefit the church. Sometimes our body is in church, but our mind is on the other side of town. Sometimes we are committed to the organization, the institution, but not the savior, you know. And inside, inside, I is committed to Christ. I mean, we have in our church, I mean, like brothers who are committed to the brotherhood. On that Sunday, you see them dress up and all of that. But the other Sundays, you don't see them at all. They are committed to that Sunday because the brotherhood is having four people. And you have other groups like that too. So we have to be careful. And it will be reflected over time. The people who are obnoxious, they knock down everything that you initiate in your organization at the committee level, whatever. Just tear down everything. They never have anything positive to say, to think, to offer. They need to watch themselves too. You could just be an inside outsider. All right, we get the gist. We can move on. All right. All right, let's move on. Secondly, salt must penetrate. All right, somebody read verse 26 for me. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Thank you. The word hate here. All right, let me ask you first, what do you understand by hate before I explain? What do you understand by hate here in the context Jesus used it? Rev, I understand hate means to love less. To love less, all right. Okay. Anybody I else? I think prepare, be prepared to go against if necessary okay all right all right mm -hmm. yeah good answers what else i think that this goes with something you said earlier yeah about the mediocrity of secondary yes, loyalty okay okay right okay all right thank you three good answers 
All right, so the word hate as used here is comparative, meaning by comparison to our love for Christ. If the meal is salted after cooking, all you will taste is salt. In similar way, Christ can never be added as an afterthought of an already full and committed life. Family loyalties can often stand in the way of ultimate loyalty to Christ. We know that too. How often your husband takes the wife out of church and out of Christ, the boyfriend takes the girlfriend, or vice versa. And the children also, you know, take us away from our important duties all the time, that sort of thing. So, yes, it can happen. The word, even his own life, are crucial for an understanding of what Jesus meant. Our life here means our visions, our plans, our personalities, our priorities. If we want to become effective salt of the earth, the Lord's salt must completely penetrate the depths of our being. Once we grow to love Christ more than ourselves or others, we are empowered to invest ourselves in creative caring in our other relationship. Put Jesus first. Question, is Christ positioned in the seat of centrality in your life? Is Christ positioned in the seat of centrality in your life? Why would you say is? You may respond. I, I always say, whatever occupies that seat is the object of your worship. Whatever gets your greatest loyalty is the object of your worship. So if it is not Christ, it is something else. All right? For those of us who make all the excuses when it comes on to the Lord's work and, you know, that sort of thing. And it's always the job that matters. It's always the this, the club, the whatever that matters. We need to maybe watch that a little. Um, who is in the driver's seat in your life? Who is in the seat of centrality? in your life at this time, why can you say that with confidence? Nobody wants to respond? Rev, um, one of our participants, Sonia, said these are very hard questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> those are the questions Jesus would ask. He put the hard questions on challenge to to, to, to those who followed him. And after a while, some left his company and says, who can manage all of this? He had to turn to the 12 and say, will you also go away? To which Peter replied, to whom shall we go? Amen. You have the word of eternal life. So it, it has to reach the point in our life where there is no alternative to Christ. No Amen. alternative to Christ. That's when you know he, he has you at his own sway. I love this song, you know. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold all my being absolute sway. Filled with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. That is so important. So the questions were not meant to be easy at all. Rev, just two things in the chat. Jackie says, he is who we seek for guidance before decisions are made. And Beverly, 
Young says, I believe there are moments when the position of centrality is taken over by my own comfort. Okay, that's honest, being honest. That is, that yes. is so true. Yes. You know, that is um, being, and, and who is not guilty? Who among us, you know, yeah. cast the first and, stone? Yes. We are, and I we say are. it's a journey. We yes. keep trying at it. We fault and we pick up and we start yes. again. Yes, yes. With the hope that we will come to perfection. That is true, yeah. Uh, and the Lord understands we are finite beings, we are limited, but he wants our heart to be in the right place. So that's when we fall down, we know that we need to get up, brush off, and to continue. Yes, yes. It's Rev, a journey. Rev, I think um, Sister Jean had a question, but just to, um, Carlene Rose says in the chat, the questions are challenging us and pointing to the to the direction we should take. Jean, okay. you have something? Okay. Yes, you know, it's so interesting, the question that you have asked, because just yesterday, no, Sunday, sorry, at St. Yes. Luke's, we, yes. we had a very interactive session Yes. And it had to do with discipleship. Okay. And we we had to look at the things that would be taking the place of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. we saw something there, just as you said, that whatever takes his place, um, right. that is what we worship. That's our idol. Yes. And yes. I genuinely it's, it's could true. not find in the list anything mm -hmm. to take. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow... After I came up from taking communion, it hit me. Yes. Self. Self. Mm -hmm. Self takes the throne sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So whereas generally I would say, yes, um, yes. Jesus is my right. Lord. And, mm -hmm. you know, I check out everything with him and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as somebody said, um, your own comfort may yeah. me come up and so on. But right. this is why Paul says, we die daily daily you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so i agree with you yvette that yes yes it's not that jesus is not our lord he is mm -hmm. and we would not give him up for anything else True. but we do slip sometimes we do and our desires sometimes override his will and right. that is why he sets the tone for us by saying to his father if it is your will Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, and yeah. that's where, where we have to live. Okay. And, and so, yes, so I, after the service, I was able to write down, self crumple up the paper and put it in the bin like other persons have been doing. Okay. Thank you for that contribution. You are right. You are right. It's a journey. As I said, if our heart is in the right place, I think we will brush off and we'll continue. All right, let's continue. Um, thirdly, the cross is the power of our salty tongue. The cross is the power of our salty tongue. We can only imagine how disturbed Jesus' followers were when he said, whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Verse 27. The cross during the time of Jesus was an instrument of execution. We are sure Jesus' listeners were alarmed about carrying their own cross. They clearly did not understand his intimations about his cross. What Jesus meant was that they must follow him with complete loyalty. His cross would give them power for the cross of obedience they would assume. Remember, the cross means love, faithfulness, surrender to Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus then is the basis of our passionate concern for others. As salt of the earth, we can communicate Hope, the hope of a new life, a new beginning, and a new relationship with God. 
to others. When we carry our own cross, it means we have died to self-will and are born anew. We are resurrected with Christ for a new life of loving others as he loved us. One of my favorite hymns is, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. And the part that says, I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. Another one is, when I survey the wondrous cross. And the last verse, I think, you know, which the last two lines, which says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. How do we understand the cross of Christ? How do we understand carrying our own cross? So when you reach that point of complete surrender, even of self, then, you know, we are able to communicate this new life and hope to others. So the question is, how can we communicate this hope and a new life to others, you know, in the world today? Ways in which we can do that? Having taken up our own cross, uh, what does this mean? How in practical ways we can communicate this hope and new life to others? Anybody? One way? Anybody? Was there something in the chat? Yes, no? yes um, Rev. Beverly yeah. says, um, by the way in which we live and interact and show love to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carol, um, Carol Jones says, let your life be an example to others. Yes. Okay. All right. Any practical example you want to point out? One way, one practical way. What does bearing one's cross in the world today mean? In light of this question. We, we also need to share the word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to talk about yes. um, what, what Christ has done for all of us and what he has done in our life. Right, right. I, I, I think seeing a need seeing a need and meeting that need without waiting to be asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, great. Um, Jackie says in the chat, being understanding, patient. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Sonia says, standing firm in our belief in Christ. Pat Sinclair, Makala says, being sensitive, to the needs of others, showing compassion and empathy. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I I saw something the social media. Somebody sent it. I think it's the um, diocese's WhatsApp or social media page, where this lady, she was born in a poor family, and she really thought she was the poorest of poor. But then somehow the Lord smiled his blessing on her. She became a, an uh, ear hostess. And she said she made a trip to Bangladesh. And somehow she walked the communities and went into the slum. And there she really saw real poverty. She thought she knew poverty, but there was where she saw poverty, extreme, extreme poverty. And she said that changed her entire life. From that day, she, in fact, she said she 
met with about 100 families and she made a pledge to them. And she said, you know, I'm going to take at least 600 of you out of poverty. And she did all sorts of things and broke so many records, you know, Guinness Book of World, World Records, she entered. Just not to big up herself, not for self-aggrandizement, but so that she could earn something to assist those persons she saw in abject poverty. And, you know, that touched me, <laughs> it really, you know. Because it, it's like Christ. Christ was king, you know. But what? He condescended and he took on our human frame and he identified with our weaknesses. He became vulnerable so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So this was real sacrifice on the part of that lady. So taking up our cross means to become sacrificed for others so that they may live more fully human lives and ultimately enter into a saving relationship with Christ, you know. So that's part of our mission. Just what I, I remember the story, um, Rev, and what uh, I remember about, that struck me was yes. that she, she made the promise she didn't even know how she was going to keep it. Yes, yes, she said it. Yes, she said and that. She that's true. Any or anything and yet because she i suppose the lord realized in in you know the the, the sort of sincerity of her yes practice. yes 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 all kinds of things that she never even knew she would have been able to that, that is true that's that is true you say you that want is true. but you you don't know if you can you know you don't mm -hmm. hear mm -hmm. god but sometimes mm -hmm. The step the Lord will, you know, work it out. And that's how the cross, you know, challenges us also to make ourselves living sacrifices. And we say that every Sunday in the celebration of the Eucharist, you know, you know yes, as these bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, so may we become channels of your love, you know. And that's what we are called to be. So we don't just come to church to fill up our tanks and go home. We come that we may be transformed as, and as we are transformed by Christ, we become agents of transformation in the world. That's what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 5. You know, that God in Christ has reconciled us to himself and he would have committed to us the ministry of reconciliation and so that's what salt does, you know. Salt transforms. Salt impacts. And so by taking up our cross, we really become salt in real ways. Real ways. The world. Yeah. All right. Next one. Rev. Um, yes. to, to Danny, may I just say something? Um, yeah, Re uh, uh, Reverend Johnson, after listening to the various views, I'm just here wondering. Yes. Because I have seen in real life now, in real life, persons who we do not even consider as inside insider or Christian mm -hmm. have relationship. I don't know if they have any relationship with Christ, but mm -hmm. some characteristics I see the I see it in them, mm -hmm. such as giving, caring, right. patient. I not cantankerous, loving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, so how mm -hmm. do you do that? How do you reconcile that? Yeah. Yeah. We have to be careful how we draw a line of demarcation or we put persons in file 13 because they are not of our faith, our church, whatever. They are not baptized. It is Christ who has the last say. You remember there was somebody who was casting out demons. And the disciples said to Jesus, stop him. We see him casting out demons in your name and he's not one of us, stop him. And Jesus says, you know, don't stop him. He who is with me can't be against me, that sort of thing. And so the Lord has the last say. So it's not for us to determine 
who is in heaven and who is in hell, who is inside, inside, always outside, outside. It's they and the Lord will have to work that out. It's not for me and you to determine, really. They and the Lord will have to work that out. But it's true. There are many who are outside of the, the structure of the church or uh, the membership of the church. But they, their heart is like gold. Their heart is a reflection of Christ. Jesus did say there are other sheep that I have that are not of this fold. They too I will bring. And there'll be one fold and one shepherd. And so it's not for you and me to write them off. We continue to pray for the work. It's interesting how many of us as Christians, we can't wait for the Lord to come uh, back for you know his people and end the world. And we sing songs like, I want to go to heaven and rest. I'm tired of staying down. I don't sing that, you know, because guess what? There are so many people who have not yet acknowledged Christ as Savior. And we know that it is not the Lord's will that any should perish. And so we should use whatever opportunity that we have on earth to attract, to be salt, to be light rather than singing, I want to go to heaven. and It's selfish of us, I think. <laughs> That's how I see. All right, moving on. And please, time me, time me, folks. We'll do it. Okay. Now, fourthly, the tangy Christian is the one who is unreservedly dependent on Christ's resources to meet Christ's challenges, all right? The parable of the builder has a hidden meaning. At first glance, we accept the surface meaning that it challenges us to have what it takes to be a disciple. And could somebody read for me uh, verse 28? It challenges us to have what it takes to be a disciple. That's a surface meaning. Could somebody read that verse? Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? All right, thank you. The deeper meaning of the parable is that we on our own will never have enough of what it takes. Jesus wants to make it clear that what he guides, he supplies. And I go back to my mantra now, that God has given to every community and individual too, all that is needed for them to do what God expects of them at any given moment. So I preached that at Synod uh, earlier this year. So I challenge the folks to go back home and communicate that to their congregation, rather than feeling sorry for themselves. Go and do what God expects of you at this time, because God would have already provided you with the resources necessary for what he expects of your congregation, your community. So don't compare yourself with another. Be who God wants you to be, given the resources, that he would have entrusted to you. So we don't need to feel sorry for ourselves. We need to trust God for him to empower us, and he will, to do what he expects of us at this time. All right. Discipleship is not mustering up our own resources to have what it takes, but receiving from our Lord what is required in each new situation and relationship. There were telling instances of incompleted towers in Jesus's day. That's why he utilized the known experience of this parable. 
Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him. Verse 29, the secret of the Christian life is in its impossibility. It was never meant to be lived on our own wisdom and power. That is so in key. A Christian with tang is one who dares to believe that because the Lord is present, then there is no limit to the miraculous interventions of his power that can invade the impotence of our daily lives. We are the salt of life with a vibrant expectation. When everyone else is negative, we are full of hope and positivity. For we know that we and Christ are already victorious. So the question is, what do you credit for the current successes or failures in your congregation? You know, and part B, what is your resolve going forward? At St. Gabriel's, our vision plan, and we paint a five-year picture, is to grow the church spiritually, functionally, numerically, financially, and there might be other alleys, but we do believe that this is what God would want, and we do believe that we have the resources in hand to grow God's kingdom spiritually, functionally, meaning what? People offering their gifts and so on, numerically to grow the numbers and financially. Because, you know, we are part of two realms, of course. There's the divine kingdom and there is the kingdom of Caesar. But the, king, the divine kingdom was always first. The, the, in, the kings of the earth were, by orientation, religious because they were supposed to be servants of God. But more and more we are seeing where, you know, uh, there's a divide. And so there are even politicians who say that the church should not meddle in politics and we should just preach the gospel and leave the politicians to do the work of politics. That is so sad, so sad. But this is our result. And we believe that if we work on it faithfully, if we are responsible for our effort, God has already provided us with the resources and he'll crown us day by day with his blessing. You might be experiencing challenges, I don't know, or there are things to celebrate. You know, what would you blame or praise for these? You know, what are the areas of challenges and what's your result leaving Bible study? To me? This might be the last question. <laughs> Uh, so um, let me hear some responses, though, because this is so important. So often we sit down and we think that the grass is green on the other side and we have nothing going for us and everything is happening at St. Andrew Parish Church or St. Luke's Crossroads or wherever and nothing happening. But we must not sit down and feel sorry for ourselves. There's no blank slate in our churches, you know. Everybody has, sometimes we are not encouraged, but sometimes we are selfish with what we have, you know. But it's important that we harness all the gifts and we bring them to the fore. You know, I walk through my congregation and I, and I pose a challenge and I say, listen, the choirs diminish and there are singers in the congregation. God tell me to tell you, go join the choir. Right now we have more people at St. Gabriel's Choir since I'm there because I've challenged them, you know. We have more servers because we have challenged them. I remember when I was in St. Mary, I did the same thing, and some of the mainstay on the choir today are persons that I challenged when I was there. Um, and so the gifts are there. How do we harness them 
uh, what do we blame then our prayers for what's happening or not happening in our congregations, you know? Maybe that's something you want to ponder on and what's your resolve leaving here? What can you do differently now with this new perspective that I'm offering to you? Anybody wants to respond? Anybody? Yes, Archdeacon. Yes. I I I was I've been thinking about your message, and I was okay. wondering that whether or not a lot of the challenge that we have as an Anglican communion, yeah. yes, the, the the lack of of persons coming forward to serve as priests, whether or not that is due to one of the questions you asked, which is that mm -hmm. as a communion we are not putting God at the center mm -hmm. of things that we treasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, well, the world has shifted in terms of values. There was a time when we had very little materially, and so everybody looked to God. I suppose after a while, when we realize what's possible, you know, in us and by us, um, and as you know, competition becomes stronger, then we 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 become more materialistic, you know, uh, relativism, things like that, kick in as well. Because we start to rationalize things now and whatever, we have to find excuses. Uh, lack of piety, God is put now on the back burner. And we're seeing all these things happening. When I go to school these days and I ask the question, I love to ask the question, you know, who are the future doctors? Who are the future nurses? Who are the future pilots? Who are the future scientists? Who are the future lawyers and so on? And then I ask, what, and you'd say all the hands when I ask, who are the future priests? <laughs> no hand at all. I would even I'll leave, ask the question, who are the future scammers? And I'll get some hands. But nobody for the ministry. I want to say to, to parents that we have a responsibility, parents and godparents, to steer our children in the path of Christ. There are parents who will deliberately try to choose the career path their children take. But guess what? Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Life. It tells us that we are all created with a purpose, a God purpose in life. And until you find that purpose and live it, you will never be fulfilled. You will always be a square peg being forced in a round hole. You know, I have operated as a priest for about 30 years or so. And um, if I was to live my life again, I would opt to be a priest because I believe this is where God has called me to serve. And I am happy, I'm fulfilled in doing so. Some are to be teachers, some are to be doctors, some are to be whatever. But it is so important that we are so conscious of the movement of God in whatever we do. And don't tell me that God used to call priests, but he's no longer calling priests. I, don't, I just think that our value system would have shifted. We are no longer a God-focused society, our world, you know. And that's why we don't have our children you know, because we're not encouraging our children in this pathway at all. I mean, in many cases now, the tail wagging the dog. When I was a little boy, my granny determined everything. Parents come to church and tell me, oh, the child is here, see, they don't want to get up and that sort of thing. I understand the challenge, but the the, the the Old Testament for reading for Sunday gone from Joshua, where Joshua put the challenge to the people. And then he said what? As for me and my house, we will serve 
galore. And I think we need to have more influence over our house, you know, uh, as parents, we need to have more influence. We can't have the children dictating the pace. And we need to talk to them about Jesus. How many of us have devotion with them as family? How many of us remind them to, to pray after meal? Thank God. And before, you know, when I remember my granny, you know, and I thank God for her every day. She would always pray every night. She would, you know, kneel down and she would invite me to kneel at the bedside too. And she would pray for everybody in the house and the whole community. And she pray for me, Lord, bless little Leroy and keep him from bad company. And when I go outside, I want to do anything wrong. My granny prayer just ringing in my ears. We don't have them kind of granny there again. You know, we, we need more of those parents, man. We will say to the child, listen, you are in my house under my influence. We're going to church. My granny just tell the parson, I was age 12, he's going to be confirmed. The parson said, I want servers. My granny said, you're going to be server. You know, and whatever it was. And then I became so involved as a result till it reached a point where I started to admire what the priest was doing and I just wanted to be. And so I would borrow the chalice and the pattern. I would buy CC Bakery Holy Buller sometime when I got AY and I would have my communion service, that sort of thing. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and they would receive it. I'm going to pulpit and I would preach and I would condemn some to hell and send some to heaven. The empty benches, you know, and people would watch me. So when I went to the priest and says, you know, I feel a sense of call to the ministry, he said to me, why you take long, so long to tell me the obvious? I saw it all along. And so... The community, again, that nurtures you is important. Both the home and the church, very important. And my people used to affirm, you know, there's when I went to church, sometimes they would ask me to say a few things because it's not every day passing here. And I know I preach a lot of heresies, but when me done, they clap me. If I clap me as if I did well, I still ask the Lord for forgiveness to this day. But they affirmed me. So there's a lot to consider as to why people are not responding. And some of us, I believe, have eaten the sour grape. I think I need to stop now. <laughs> uh, thank you, folks, for having me. It was a pleasure. I still have three more, but maybe another time. Bless you. Thank you. Reverend, couldn't you just take them without discussing the three? Just tell us what they are. Just the headache. Okay. All right, uh, the fifth one is a salty saint is a source of courage in life's battle. And this one has to do with the king going to warfare. The sixth one is people who are the salt of the earth are no longer possessed by their possessions. They relate to them, but they are not possessed by them. And the seventh one is the salt of the earth is the replenishable discipleship. In other words, we only have what we give away. You know, it's interesting. Love is something if you give it away. Joy is something. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. So I just want to end by asking, you know, um, what are your sources of refueling spiritually? Because you can only give what's inside of you. You can't give what you don't have. Otherwise, the Lord will say you are blind guides and hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchers. Think about your prayer life, your study life, your Eucharistic life, your church participation, things like that. And a lot more. Thank you, folks. It was a pleasure sharing with you. Thanks for having me. Blessing. Um, Rev, we're going to play a special 
meditation piece, counting okay. the past. And then we're going to ask you at the end of that to, to do a special prayer for all of us on the platform. All, all of us will view. Yes. And we'll have the closing remarks and then we'll ask you to come back and do the benediction. So we want to take that special meditation piece, counting the cost you now, and then we ask you to come back and do that special prayer for all of us. No problem. No problem. Great God, you are the source of our lives, the source of our joy, the source of our stay. 
We thank you for this moment spent with you. We are conscious of your guiding hands. Thank you for the way you have guided us. We pray, oh God, that as you, as you have spoken to our ears, you'll also speak to our hearts. Your word has wings of its own and it can fly into the very inner recesses of our being. We ask, Lord, that day by day, you'll continue to grow us, make us inside insiders, people who are wholly available to you. Help us, Lord, teach us how to abide in you day by day, as we are strengthened by your word and sacrament as our involvement in the life of your kingdom help to shape us. And then, Lord, use us as ambassadors of your kingdom, that through us your name may be honored and glorified and your kingdom advanced on earth. So continue to prosper us and prosper your church. We pray, Lord, for this Bible study group and every participant. Pray, Lord, that you will touch us anew and make us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. Fill us to overflowing with excitement with your goodness. And so, Lord, as we leave this place, as we leave this study, do not leave our presence. We ask, Lord, that you'll abide with us always because lord unless you are with us we dare not take the next step but when you are with us then you can lead us lord where you will and we will not fear bless you lord we thank you that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world so we praise you and we claim your blessings in advance we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Rev, thank you so thank much. Uh, we certainly have you back, Rev. I can tell you. Thank you thank for you. your Okay. Study. No it problem. It is appreciated. And a lot of comments are in the chat. The, okay. Those platform are very, very happy and they have been blessed. Um, happy to be here too. Um, just to remind us that um, next week, we have two more weeks um, to close out our study. Next week, we're looking at the rich man and Lazarus. God willing, I'll be leading you through that study. And then we end the last Tuesday in November, reflection and response, the prayer team. Remember to invite a friend and see you again next week. Godspeed. Once again, Rev, thank you so much. Welcome. Very welcome. Blessing. Rev, we're going to ask you to do the benediction. God bless you. Blessing. Yes. And to God's gracious mercy, we commit you all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, abide with you all this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Rev. Blessings all. Peace. Godspeed. Peace.